Well, and welcome back to theCUBE presents the AWS Startup Showcase. The next big thing in cloud startups with AI, security, and life science tracks. 15 hottest growing startups uh, presented. And we had a great opening keynote with luminaries in the industry. And now our closing keynote is to get a deeper dive on cracking the code in the enterprise, how startups are changing the game and helping companies change. And they're also changing the game with open source. We have a great guest, Katie Drucker, head of business development from Madrona Venture Group. Katie, thank you for coming on the, the Cube for this special uh, key, closing keynote. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. So one of the topics we talked about with Soma from Madrona on the opening keynote, as well as Ali from uh, Databricks is how startups are seeing success faster. So, and that's the theme of the cloud, speed, agility, but the game has changed in the enterprise. And I want to really dis discuss with you how growth changes and growth strategy specifically they talk go to market, we hear things like good sales, enterprise sales, organic, freemium. It's all kinds of different approaches. But at the end of the day, the most successful companies, the ones that are, might not be known, that just come out of nowhere. So the economics are changing and the buyers are thinking differently. So let's explore that topic. So um, take us through your view, because you have a lot of experience. For first, tell you about your role at Madrona and what you do. Absolutely. Um, all great points. So my role at Madrona, I think I have um, uh, personally one of the more enviable jobs in that my job is to, um, I get the privilege of working with all of these fantastic entrepreneurs in our portfolio and doing whatever we can as a firm to harness resources, knowledge, uh, expertise, connections to accelerate their growth. So my role in setting up business development is taking a look at all of those tools in the tool chest and, and partnering with the portfolio to make it so. And in our portfolio, we have a wide range of companies. Some rely on enterprise sales, some have other go to markets, some are direct to consumer, um, a, a wide range. Talk about the growth strategies that, are, that you see evolving because what's clear with the pandemic and as we come out of it is that there are growth plays happening that don't look a little bit differently, more obvious now because of the cloud scale. We're seeing companies like Databricks, like Snowflake, like other companies that have been built on the cloud or standalone. What are some of the new growth techniques or I don't want to say growth hacking because that kind of got a pejorative term, but like just a, a way for companies to quickly describe their value to an enterprise buyer who's moving away from the old RFP days of you know, vendor selection. The, the game has changed. So how, take us through how you see that secret key and, that, and, that, and unlocking that, that new equation of how to present value to an enterprise and how you see enterprises evaluating startups. Yes, absolutely. Well, and that's got a question that's got a, a few components nestled in what I think are some bigger trends going on. Um, AWS, of course, brought us the cloud first. I think now um, the cloud is more and more a utility, right? And so it's incumbent upon thinking about how an enterprise who's using the cloud is going to go up the, the value stack and, and partner with its cloud provider and, and other service providers. I think also within that, with that agility of operations, you have thinning, if you will, of the systems of record and a lot of new entrants into the space that are saying things like, how can we harness AI ML and, and, and other emerging trends to provide more value uh, directly around work streams that were historically locked into those systems of record. And then I think you also have some price plans that are far more flexible around um, usage based as opposed to just flat subscription or even these big clunky annual or multi-year RFP type stuff. So all of those trends are really designed in ways that favor the emerging startup. And I think if done well and in partnership with those cloud underlying cloud providers, there can be some amazing benefits that the enterprise realizes and an opportunity for those startups to grow. And I think that's what you're seeing. I think there's also this emergence of a buyer that's different than the CIO or the CISO. You have uh, things with low code, no code. You've got other buyers in the organization, other line of business executives that are coming to the table making uh, software purchase decisions. And then you also have empowered developers 
that are these kind of citizen builders and, and, and developer buyers and personas that, that really matter. So lots of more, lots of inroads and places for a startup to reach in, in the enterprise to make a connection and to, to bring value. That's great, great insight. I want to ask, uh, just if you don't mind, follow up on that. You mentioned personas. And what we're seeing as the shift happens, there's new roles that are emerging and new things that are being reconfigured or refactored, if you will, whether it's human resources or AI, and you mentioned ML playing a role in automation. These are big parts of the new uh, value proposition. How should companies um, posture to the customer? Because you know, I don't want to say pivot, because that means it's not working, but mostly extending or iterating around their positioning, because as new things have not yet been realized, it might not be operationalized in the company, or maybe new things need to be operationalized, but it's a new solution for that. Positioning the value is super important. And a lot of companies often struggle with that, but also if they get it right, that's the key. What's your feeling on startups and their positioning? Some people will dismiss it, like, oh, that's, that's marketing. But maybe that's important. What's your thoughts on the great positioning yeah. question? I've, I've, I've been in this industry a long time and, and I think you know, there are some things that are just tried and true and it, and it is not unique to tech, which is, look, you have to tell a story and you have to reach the customer and you have to speak to the customer's need. So what I, and what that means is, um, you know, AWS is a great example. They're famous for the whole concept of working back from the customer and, and thinking about what that customer's need is. I think any startup that is looking to partner or work alongside of AWS really has to embody that very, very customer centric way of thinking about things. Even though, as we just talked about, those personas are, are changing who that customer really is in the enterprise. And then speaking to that value proposition and, and meeting that customer and, and creating a dialogue with them that really helps to understand not only what their pain points are, but how your um, offering solves those pain points. And sometimes the customer doesn't realize that that is their pain point and that's part of the education and, and part of the way in which you engage that dialogue. Um, that doesn't change a lot, just you know, generation to generation. I think the modality of how we have that dialogue um, the the methods in which we choose to convey that change, but that 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 basic discussion is kind of what makes us human. What's your uh, great 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 insight? I want to ask you on the value proposition question again. The the question I often get and it's hard to answer is, am I competing on value or am I competing on commodity? And and depending on where you are in the stack, there could be different things. Like for example, land is getting faster, smaller, cheaper, as an example on Amazon. That's you know driving down to low cost, high value, but it shifts up the stack. You're starting to see in companies, this changing the criteria for how to evaluate. So an enterprise might be struggling, and I often hear enterprises say, I kind of don't know how to pick who I need. I buy tools, I don't buy many platforms. So they're constantly trying to look for that answer key, if you will. What's your thoughts on, on the changing requirements of, of an enterprise? Uh, and how to do vendor selection. Yeah, um, so obviously I don't have, you know, I don't think there's a single magic bullet. I always like just philosophically to think about, I think it's always easier and and frankly more exciting as a buyer to want to buy stuff that's going to help me make more revenue and, and build and grow as opposed to do things that save me money. And I and, and just in a binary way, I kind of like to think which side of the fence are you sitting on as a product offering? Um, and the best ways that you can articulate that, you know, what opportunities are you unlocking for your customer? Um, the problems that you're solving, what kind of growth and what impact is that going to lead to? Even if you're one or two removed from that. And, um, and again, that's not a, a new concept. Um, and I think that, that companies that have that squarely in mind when they think about their go-to-market strategy, when they think about the dialogue they're having, when they think about the, the problems that they're solving, um, find a, a, a much faster path. And I think that also kind of speaks to why we're seeing some of the explosion on the line of business SaaS apps that are out there. Again, that thinning of the systems of record, really thinking about what are the scenarios and work streams that we can have happen that are going to help with that um, revenue growth and, and unlocking those opportunities. What's the common startup challenge that you see when 
they're trying to do business development. Usually they build the product first, product led value, you hear that a lot. Uh, then they go, okay, we're ready to sell, hire a sales guy. Uh, what is that, I mean, that seems to be kind of shifting away because the go to markets are changing. Have you seen any, um, what are some of the challenges that startups have? What, what are some things that you're seeing? Well, and I think the, the point that you're making about the changes are really almost a result of the kind of trends that we're talking about. The sales organization itself is becoming, you know, these work streams are becoming instrumented, data is being collected, insights are being derived off of those things. So you see companies like Clary or Highspot or two examples or Tesorio that are, you know, in our portfolio that are kind of looking at that, um, at that action and, and making the art of sales and marketing far more sophisticated overall, um, which then leads to the different growth hacking and the different insights that are driven. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think that common mistakes that I see across the board, especially with earlier stage startups, look, you know, you got to find product market fit. I think that's always, you know, you start with a thesis or a belief and a passion that you're building something that you think the market needs. And it's a lot of dialogue you have to have to make sure that, that you do find that. I think once you find that, another common problem that I see is leading with an explanation of technology. And again, not focusing on the buyer uh, or the sell, sorry, the buyer about solving a problem and focusing on that problem as opposed to focusing on how cool your technology is. Those are basic and really, really simple. Um, and then I think setting a set of expectations, especially as it comes to business development and partnering with companies like AWS, the resourcing that you need to adequately meet the demand that can be turned on, um, and that I'm sure you heard about from Databricks, um, from, from an organization like AWS, you have to be pragmatic. Yeah, I mean, Databricks gone from zero uh, software sales a few years ago to over a billion now, it looks like. Uh, Snowflake, which came out of nowhere, I mean, they had a great product, but built on Amazon, they they became the data cloud on top of Amazon, and now they're growing. Just whole new business models and new business development techniques. Katie, thank you for sharing your insight here uh, on theCUBE's uh, closing keynote. Thanks for, for coming on. Appreciate it, thank you. Okay, Katie Drucker, Head of Business Development at Madrona Venture Group, uh, Premier VC in the Seattle area and beyond. They're doing a lot of cloud action, and of course, they know AWS very well. Uh, and investing in the ecosystem. So great, great stuff there. Uh, next up is Peter Wagner, partner at wing.vc. Love this URL, first of all, because you got the, the VC uh, domain extension. But Peter is a longtime venture capitalist. I've been following his career. He goes back to the old networking days, back when the internet was being connected during the OSI days when uh, the TCP IP open systems interconnect was really happening and created so much wealth. Peter, great to see you on theCUBE here and, and uh, congratulations with success at Wing VC. Yeah, thanks John. Um, it was great to be here. I really appreciate you having me. The reason why I wanted to have you come on, first of all, you had a great track record in investing over many decades. You've seen many waves of innovation, startups. You know, you've seen all the stories. You've seen the movie a few times, as I say. Uh, but now more than ever, it's really kind of, Enterprise wise, it's probably the hottest I've ever seen it. You got a confluence of, of many things on the stack. You were also an, an early seed investor in Snowflake, well regarded as a huge success. So you got your eye on some of these awesome deals. You've got a great partner um, over there who's got networking experience as well. What is the, the big aha moment here for the industry? Because it's not your classic enterprise startups anymore. They have multiple things going on. Um, and some of the winners are not even known, they come out of nowhere and they connect to enterprise and get the lucrative positions and can create a moat and value, like out of nowhere. It's not the old way of like going to the airport and doing RFP and you know, going through the stringent requirements and then you're in, you get to win the lucrative contract and you're in. Not anymore, this seems to have changed. Wow. What's your take on this? Because people are trying to crack the code here and sometimes you don't have to be well known. Yeah, well, and thank goodness the game has changed because that, that old game was, <laughs> Uh, brain exploding in many ways. Uh, so I, I, for one, don't miss it. Um, you know, there, there's a modernization movement in the enterprise. I mean, the, the modern enterprise uh, is built on data, powered by AI, and structured as an agile workplace. And these are, you know, all three of those things are, are really transformational. There's big investments being made by enterprises, a lot of receptivity and openness to how technology can enable all those agendas. Um, and that, you know, that translates uh, into good prospects for startups. So I think, you know, as far as my career goes, I've never seen uh, 
sort of a more uh, a more positive or, or fertile ground for startups in terms of penetrating the enterprise. It doesn't mean it's easy to do, uh, but you know, but you have a receptive audience on the other side, and that you know that hasn't necessarily always been the case. Yeah, I got um, I got to ask you. I know that um, P, um, you're a big sailor in your family, and Frank Lupin's also has a boat. And sailing metaphor is always good to have because you got to have a, a race that's being run, and and, and they got have tactics. Uh, and and this game that we're in now, if you see the successes, there's investment theses, and then there's also actually bets. Okay, and and I want to get your thoughts on this because a lot of enterprises are trying to figure out how to evaluate startups and startups also can make the wrong bet. They could sail to the wrong continent and be in the wrong spot, right? So how do you pick the winners and how should enterprises understand how to pick winners too? Yeah, well, you know, one of the, one of the real sort of important things right now that enterprise facing startups are learning how to do is they're learning how to leverage product like growth dynamics uh, in selling to the enterprise, right? And, you know, so product like growth has uh, certainly always been important in consumer facing companies. And then there's a few enterprise facing companies, early ones uh, that um, kind of crack the code, as you say. Uh, and, and some of these examples are so old, you don't even think about them, you know? Like the ones that people want, will want to talk about, they want to talk about Atlassian, they want to talk about Twilio, and these are of course iconic uh, companies that showed the way for others. But even before them, you had, you know, folks like SolarWinds, um, you know, their, their go to market model is clearly Product led bottoms up, you know, back when we didn't even have those words to talk about it. And then some of the examples are so enormous, you don't even think about them, like they're right in front of your face, like AWS, yeah. you know, <laughs> pretty, pretty good PLG uh, company, right? You know, but it, it, it targeted builders, it targeted developers, and, and, and flipped over the way you think about enterprise infrastructure, uh, you know, as a result. And, and so now, yeah, you know, every company, you know, even even if they're harnessing um, a, a relatively conventional sales and marketing motion, they need to think about product-led growth as, as a way to kick that motion off. And so it's not really an either or anymore. You know, you might think, oh, PLG, that means there's no salespeople in the company. Not true. I mean, you know, but PLG is a way to set the table so that you can very efficiently use your sales and marketing resources only on the most attractive targets uh, and, and ones that, you know, really can accelerate your change. You know, I, I love the <laughs> product. I love the product led growth. I got to ask you because in the networking days, I remember the term inimitability was used, being nested in in a, in a, in a solution. The difference between a Cisco router and a firewall is one you can unplug and replace with another vendor. Cisco, you'd have to <laughs> go through, you know, no, I mean, switching costs were huge, right? I mean, it's so when you get into the cloud, how do you see the competitiveness? Because we were riffing on this with Ali from Databricks where the, uh, the lock-in might be value, right? The more value you provide is the lock-in. Is there nestedness? Is there inimitability in, as a competitive advantage for some of these startups? How do you look at that? Because, you know, startups, they're using open source. They want to have a, a land position in an, in an enterprise, but how do they create that sustainable competitive advantage um, going forward? Because again, you, you, this is what you do. You bet on ones that you can see that could establish a mode or whatever we want to call it, but a competitive advantage, an ongoing times, nested yeah. position. A lot of times it has to do with data, John. Um, you know, and, and so you, you mentioned Snowflake a couple times here. Um, it, you know, a big part of Snowflake's strategy is uh, you know, what, they, what they now call the data cloud. And you know, one of the reasons you go there is not to just be able to process data, uh, but to actually get access to it and exchange it with partners um, and then uh, you know that that of course is a great a great reason for customers to come to the to the Snowflake, plat Snowflake platform. And so you know the more data, it gets more customers, it gets more data. You know and the whole thing the whole thing starts spinning in the right direction. And you know that that's a really big example. But um, all all of these startups that are using uh, ML in in a fundamental way, applying it in a novel way, uh, you know the the data modes are really important. Uh, so getting getting to the right data sources and, and training on it and then putting it to work so that you can steer that business process better and doing this, you know, sort of earlier on that scale. I mean, that's a big part of success. Uh, another, you know, company that I work with is a good example of that called Gong, uh, which works in the sales technology space, uh, really, really crushing it uh, in terms of um, building better sales organizations, uh, both at the rep performance level in terms of deal intelligence level and just overall you know, revenue, revenue attainment using ML and using really novel data sources like you know the, the previously lost data or phone calls uh, or Zoom calls as they are now. 
Uh, so that so I think the data advantages are, are really are really big, and, and, and smart smart startups are thinking through it early. It's interesting, um, and they're planning. they by the way, not to ramble on here too much, but they're, you know they're embedding that in their PLG uh, strategy. So their land motion is designed not just to you know to be uh, sort of an interesting way to, to gain usage, but it's also a way to gain access to data that then enables uh, you know the expand in, in, in a compelling. I mean, that's a huge call out point there. Um, I was going to ask another question, but that I think that is the key uh, I see. It's a new go to market in a way. I mean, product led with that kind of approach gets you a beachhead. <laughs> you get a little, you get a little position, you get some data. That is a cloud scale model, right? I mean, variable, whatever you want to call the variable value proposition, value proof or whatever, getting that data and, and reiterating it. So it brings up the whole kind of, you know, philosophical question of, okay, product-led growth, I love that with data, product-led growth with data, I get that. Remember the old platform versus a tool? That's the way buyers used to think. How has that changed? Because now almost, this conversation kind of throws out the whole platform thing, but isn't yeah. like everything's a platform? A I mean, everything, everything has to look like a tool. <laughs> um, even if it is a platform, don't admit it. Uh, you know, you can you can reveal that later, but you know, you're 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 looking for adoption. You know, so if it's a down stack product, um, you're looking for adoption by like developers or DevOps people or SREs. And they're trying to solve a problem, you know, that, and and they want rapid you know gratification. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they, you know, they don't want to have an architectural um, lobotomy you know placed in front of them. Um, and, and if it's an upstack product, an application. Uh, you know, then it's sort of a user, a lot of business user or whatever that is, is adopting the application. And again, they're, they're trying to solve a very specific problem. You need instant, immediate, obvious uh, time to value. Uh, and and now, now you have a ticket to the dance and you can build on that. And, and maybe, yeah. maybe the platform strategy can gradually uh, take shape. But, um, you know, you know who's not in this conversation is the CIO. <laughs> Uh, right, you know, they're. It's like I'm always the last to know. You know, you know. So the, <laughs> That's a CISO, though. They're the, they're on, they're on the firing lines. I mean, CISOs yeah, are like sure. buying tools like it's nobody's business. They need everything they can. They'll buy anything. Or you go in with sand, they'll buy it. Well, you make it sound so easy. I, you know, I'm, <laughs> we do a lot of security investing. If only, if only. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit over the top. But I mean, CISOs are under a lot of pressure. I mean, I would talk to the CISO at Capital One and. He was saying that you know he's on Amazon now. He's going to another cloud, not as a hedge, but but he doesn't want to focus development team. So he's making human resource decisions as well. Again, back to what IT used to be back in the old days, where you made a vendor decision, you built around it. So again, clouds play that way. I see that happening. But the question is, is that I think you nailed this whole idea of crosshairs on the target persona because you got to know who you are, and then go to the market. So if you know you're a problem solving, and the lower in the stack, do it and get a beachhead. That's a strategy. You could do that. Yeah. You can't try to be the platform and then solve a problem at the same time. So you got to, you can't, you got, you got to be careful. Is that, is that what you were kind of getting at? Well, I, you know, I think you just understand what you're trying to achieve in that land motion, right? And, and, and how those dynamics work and you just, you can't drag it out. Um, you know, you can't make it, make it too difficult. Another, another company I work with is, is a very strategic cloud data platform. You know, it's a, it's a company called Pinecone Systems. We are not trying to foist that vision, though, <laughs> on, on, on adopters today. You know, we're solving um, some thorny problems for them in the short term, uh, rapid time to value, sort of operational ease and scale. You know, and then yeah, once once they've had success with Pinecone, um, there is there will be an opportunity to be increasing the platform um, in, in the ML ops world for those types of for those customers. But you know, we're not talking about that uh, early on. Well, Peter, I appreciate you taking the time of coming out of a board meeting. I know that you know, you're super busy and I really appreciate you making time for us. I know you got an impressive partner in Garv Garv, who's a former Sequoia, but Redback Networks, uh, part of that company over the years. You guys are doing extremely well. You've been a unique investment thesis. I'd like you uh, to get the plug in for the firm. I think you guys have a good approach. I like what you guys are doing. You're humble. You don't brag a lot, but you make a lot of great investments. So could you take a minute to explain what your investment thesis is and then how that relates to how an enterprise is making their investment thesis? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, they, you know, that concept that I described earlier, the, the modern enterprise movement, adds a workplace built on data powered by AI. I mean, that's what we're trying to work with founders to enable. You know, so we're investing in companies that build the products and services uh, that enable that modern enterprise uh, uh, to exist. 
Uh, and we do it from very early stages, but with a, a long-term outlook. So we'll, we'll be leading seed in Series A uh, rounds of investment, but staying deeply involved both operationally and financially throughout the whole life cycle of the company. You know, we've done that a bunch of times. You know, our, our goal is always uh, the big independent public company. Uh, and, uh, you know, they don't always make it, but enough of them do <laughs> to, to have, it, uh, have it all be worthwhile. Um, you know, an, an interesting special case of this, and by the way, I think it intersects with some of uh, the startup showcase here, is in the life sciences. And I know you were, you were highlighting a lot of healthcare and life sciences deals. And that's, that's a, a vertical where you just have tremendous impact of data, uh, both new data availability and new ways to put it to use. I know, you know several of my partners are very focused on that. They call it BioX data. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, a transformation all, of, all on its own. That's awesome. And I think that the reason why we're focusing on these verticals is if you have a cloud horizontal scale view and vertically specialized with machine learning, every vertical is impacted by data. And it's so interesting that I think, you know, for a startup, it's probably the best time to be a cloud startup right now. I really am bullish on it. So appreciate you taking the time, Peter, to come in. Again, from your board meeting, popping out. Um, Thanks for getting back. Go, to, window one zoom. <laughs> go back in and approve those stock <laughs> options for all the employees. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure. Okay. Peter Wagner, uh, Premier VC, uh, very humble. Wing.vc is a great firm. Um, really respect them. They do a lot of great investing. They invest in Snowflake. And we have Dave Vellante back, who knows a lot about Snowflake. He's been covered like a blanket in Sarbicho Wall. Cloud influencer, friend of the cube, uh, cloud um, uh, commentator cloud experience, built clouds, runs clouds, now invests. Um, so I beat Dave, thanks for coming back on. You heard Peter Wagner at Wing VC. These guys have their roots in networking, which networking back in the day was, a, Dave, you remember the internet Cisco days, remember? Cisco, Wellfleet routers. I think Peter invested in Arrowpoint. Remember Arrowpoint? That was about in the 495 built where you are. Um, was it uh, that Lynch's company? That was Chris Lynch's company. Yeah. I think, wasn't he a sales guy? They wasn't, you know. that was his, yeah, that was his first big hit, I think. All right, well guys, let's wrap this up. We got a great program here. Sarbi, thank you for coming on. No worries, uh, glad to be here guys. Yeah, uh, first of all, mm -hmm. really appreciate the Twitter activity lately on the commentary, the observability piece on Jeremy Burton's launch. Dave was phenomenal. But Peter was talking about this dynamic that I think kind of ties this cracking the code theme together, which is there's a product led strategy that feels like a platform, but it's also a tool. In other words, they're not mutually exclusive. The old methods thrown out the window land in an account, know who, what problem you're solving if you're below the stack, nail it, get data, and go from there. If you're a process improvement up the stack, you're going to have to much more of a platform, longer term sale, more business oriented. Different motions, different mechanics. What do you think about that? What's your reaction? Yeah, I, I think the, I was thinking about this when I was listening to some of the startups that, uh, pitching, if you will, or talking about what they bring to the table in this uh, cloud scale or, or this cloud era, if you will. Um, and there are tools, there are applications, and then there are um, um, big sort of monolithic uh, uh, platforms, if you will, and then they are part of the ecosystem. So I think the companies need to know where they play. A startup cannot be platform from the get-go, I believe. Uh, many aspire to be, but they have to start with tooling, I believe, and especially in B2B uh, sort of side of things, and then go into the applications. Uh, like one way is to go into the application area, if you will, like very precise use cases for certain verticals and stuff like that. And the other part is like going into the platform, which is like horizontal play, if you will, in technology, right? So I think they have to understand their, their sort of, age, like how old they are, how new they are, how small they are, because vendor size matters. When you are procuring, as a big business, procuring your technology, vendor size matters, and their uh, economic viability matters, um, and their proximity to other vendors matters as well. So I think we'll jump into that in the other discussions later, but I think that's uh, that's key, as you said. I would agree with that. I would I would phrase it in my mind somewhat, somewhat differently, Sarbjeet, which is, you have product-led growth, and that's kind of your early phase, and you get product market fit, you get product-led growth, and then you you expand. And there are many, many examples of this, and that's when you, to to as part of your TAM expansion strategy, you're going to get into the you know the platform discussion. There's so many examples of that. You take a look at Ali Goatsy, Goatsy today with what's happening at Databricks Snowflake is another good example that started with product-led growth, 
And then now they're like, okay, we got to expand the TAM. Okta is another example. They just acquired Auth0. That's about you know building out the platform versus more of a point product. And there's just many, many examples of that, but you cannot, to your point, very hard to start with a with a platform. I mean, ARM kind of did it, but that was like a one in a million chance. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just harder, especially if it's new and it's not operationalized yet. So one of the things, Dave, that we've observed in the cloud is some of the best known successes were nobodies, not known at all. I mean, Databricks, we've been covering from the beginning because we were close to that movement when they came out of Berkeley, but you know, they still were misunderstood and, and you know, they just started generating revenue in on a tear. So again, only a few years ago, zero software revenue. Now they're approaching a billion dollars. So it's not easy to make these vendor selections anymore. So, so and if you're new and you're you don't have someone to operate it or you're, there's no department or and the department's changing, that's another problem. These are all kind of like enterprise-y problems. What's your, what's your thoughts on that, Dave? Well, I think, um, you know, there's a big discussion right now with, with you, you've, you've been talking all day about, you know, how should enterprise think about startups and think about most of these startups, they're software companies and software is a very capital efficient business. At the same time, these companies are raising hundreds of millions you know, sometimes over a billion dollars before they go to IPO. Why is that? I mean, a lot of it's going to promotion. I mean, I, I look at it as, and there's a big discussion going on about, well, maybe sales can be more efficient and more direct and so forth. I, I really think it comes down to the, to the golden rule. Two things really matter in, in, in early days of the startup, it's sales and engineering. And I should probably say engineering and sales You start with engineering and then you got to figure out your go to market. You know, everything else is peripheral to those two. If you don't get those two things right, you struggle. And, and I think that's what some of these successful startups are proving. Sarbi, what's your take on, on that point? I, I, can you repeat the point again? Sorry, I lost my... As cloud scale comes in, this whole yeah. idea of competing, you know, what, what the roles are changing, right? So, I mean, yeah, look yeah, at yeah. IOT, look at the edge, for instance, you know, you got all yeah, kinds yeah. of new use cases that no one actually knows is a problem to solve, it's just a pure opportunity, right? So there's no one's operational, I could have a product, but if no one's, if, no, if it doesn't, yeah. If I don't, no one can buy it yet. It's a problem. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think the, the the solutions have to be point solutions, and the startups need to focus on the practitioners number one, not the big buyers, not the IT, if you will, but the line of business. Uh, even even within that sphere, like just focus on the practitioners who are going to use that technology. I, I thought that, I think it was a fiddler um, or no, it was Coralogs, Coralogics. Um, I think that story was great today earlier and in, in how they kind of struggled in the beginning they were trying they were trying to do a big bang approach as a startup but then they almost kind of stumbled and then they, they found stumble. their mojo <laughs> if you if you will they they went to down the market actually that's a very classic uh, theory of disruption you know, like what we study from Harvard School of Business that you go down the market uh, go to the non-consumers because if you're trying to compete head to head with big guys, right? Because most of the big guys have a um, lot of feature and functionality, especially at the platform level. And if you're trying to in uh, innovate in that sort of space, you have to go to the practitioners and solve their core problems and then expand, sort of land and expand kind of thing. So I think um, you have to focus on practitioners um, a lot more than uh, the traditionally what are called buyers. You know, Sarbjeet, we had a great thread last night in Twitter on observability that you, you started. And there's a couple of examples there. I mean, you know, Chaos Search is this, you know, relatively you know, small company right now. They just raised some dough when they're part of this you know, start showcase. And they're, they could have they could have said, hey, we're going to go after Splunk, but they chose not to. They said, okay, let's kind of disrupt the Elk stack and simplify that. Another example is a company Observe. You know, you mentioned, you know, Jeremy Burton's company, John. They're focused really on SaaS companies. They're not going after initially these these complicated enterprise, you know, uh, deals because they they got to get it right or else they'll they'll get churn and churn is that silent killer of software companies. Well, the the interesting other company that was on this showcase was Tetra Science. I don't know if you noticed that one on the life science track. And again, Peter yeah. Wagner pointed out the life science. You know, that's an under recognized in the press vertical that's exploding. Uh, certainly during the pandemic, you saw it. Tetra Science is an R&D cloud, Dave, R&D data cloud. So pharmaceuticals, they need to do their research. So the pandemic has brought to life this now notion of tapping into data resources, not just data lakes, but like real deal. Yeah, you you and Natalie and I were talking about that this morning. And that's, you know, one of the opportunities is to, for R&D, 
and you have all these different data sources and, and, and yeah, it's not just about the data lake, it's about the ecosystem that you're building around them. And I see, it's really interesting to sort of juxtapose what, what Databricks is doing and what Snowflake is doing. They've got sort of different strategies, but they, they play a part there. You can, you can see how ecosystems can build. It's just, it's not one company is going to solve all these problems. It's going to really have to be, you know, connections across these, these various companies. And that's what the cloud enables and ecosystems have all this data flowing that yeah. can really drive, you know, new insights. Yeah, and I was, I want to call your attention to uh, a tweet, sorry, you wrote about Splunk's earnings and, uh, you know, talk about the data, their data company as well. We got Teresa Carlson there now from AWS as the president, working with Doug, that should change the game a little bit more. But there was a thread underneath there, uh, Andy Thurai says uh, to replies to Dave Yu, or sorry, you, if you're on AWS, they are a fine solution, period. The world doesn't just revolve around AWS smiley face. Well, a lot of it does actually. So, <laughs> you know, nice, nice point, Andy. Um, but he's, he brings up this thing and Ali brought it up too. Hybrid now is the new operating system for what now Edge does. So we got Mobile World Congress happening this month in person. This whole telco 5G brings up a whole nother piece of the cloud puzzle. Okay, Jeff Barr pointed out in his keynote, Dave, Guys, I want to get your reaction. The edge now is, I'm calling it the super edge because it's not just edge as we know it before. It's, you're going to have these pops, these points of presence that are going to have wavelength. Azure Spectre or whatever they have, I think that's the solution for Azure. So you're going to have all this new cloud power for low latency applications. Self-driving delivery, VR, AR, gaming, uh, telemetry data from Tesla's. I mean, you name it, it's happening. This is huge. What's your thoughts? Sorry, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I, I think um, edge is like bound to happen and for many reasons, uh, the, the volume of data is increasing. Uh, our use cases are um, also sort of expanding, if you will, with the, with the democratization of computer and also specialization of computer. Actually, Dave wrote extensively about how Intel and and other chip players are, are, are sort of um, gearing up for that future, if you will. Uh, the end, most of the inference uh, in the AI world will happen in the field close to the, uh, the workloads, if you will. They, that can be mobility, the self-driving cars, it can be AR, VR, it can be healthcare, it can be gaming, you name it. Those are the few use cases which, will, which are in the forefront, and, but, but a lot more use cases will come into the play, I believe. I think um, uh, Edge, I have said this many times, Edge, I think will be dominated by the by the um, hyperscalers mainly, because they are building their metro data centers now and with the very low latency in the metro areas where the population is, we are still serving the people still, <laughs> not the machines yet, or the empty you know, um, areas where there's no population. So wherever the population is, all, all these big players are putting their, their data centers there and I think they will, they will dominate the edge. And I, uh, I know some some edge lovers. They don't like which edge who, don't, who don't edge like hugger, who, edge huggers. Edge huggers, yeah. They don't <laughs> like the hyperscaler story. But I think that is that's the way we are going. You know, why edge, will we go backwards? Well, they, no, I think the, well, you're right. First of all, I, I agree with the hyperscalers. Don, you look at the top three clouds right now. They're all in the edge hardcore. It's a huge competitive battleground, Dave. And I well, think the missing piece that's going to be uncovered at Mobile World Congress. Maybe they'll miss it this year. But it's the developer traction. Whoever um, wins the developer market or, or wins the loyalty winning over the market or having adoption, the well, applications I, will drive the edge. And, and I would say, I would add the fourth cloud is Alibaba. Alibaba is actually bigger than Google and they are crushing it as well. But I would say this, first of all, it's popular to say, oh, you know, not everything's <laughs> going to move into the cloud, John, Dave, Sarbjeet. But the fact is that <laughs> AWS, the trendsetter, I mean, they are, crushing it in terms of features and you look at what they're doing in, 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 in the plumbing with, with Annapurna. I mean, it's and everybody's following suit. So you just, you can't just ignore that, number one. Second thing is, what is the edge? Well, the edge is, where's the logical place to process the data, right? That's what the edge is. And I think, you know, to your point, both Sarbjeet and John, you know, the edge is going to be won by developers. It's going to be won by programmability and it's going to be low cost and really super efficient and it's going to, most of the data is going to stay at the edge. And so 
who is in the best position to actually create that? You know, is it going to be somebody who's taking an X86 box and throwing it over the fence and giving it a fancy name with edge in it and saying, here's our edge box? No, that's not what's going to win the edge. And so I think it's, first of all, it's huge. It's wide open. And I think, where's the innovation coming from? I agree, agree with you. It's the hyperscale. I think the developers, as, as, as uh, John said, developers are the, the king makers. They, they build the solutions. And in that context, I always talk about the skills gravity, you know, like a lot of people are educated in certain technologies and they will keep using those technologies. Their proximity to that technology is huge and they don't want to learn some, something new. So um, as humans, we, we just tend to, you know, go what we know how to use it, you know? So that on, from that front, front, I usually talk about the consumption economics of the cloud and edge. It, it has to focus on the practitioners, and in this case, practitioners are developers, because you're just cooking up those solutions right now. We're not serving that in huge sort of quantity and um, right now, but- Well, let's um, unpack that, sorry, because I think, let's unpack that, because I think you're right on the money on that. The consumption of the tech and also the consumption of the of the application, the, the end use, end end use, all right? So, so if, and I, and I think the reason why hyperscales will continue to dominate besides the fact that they have all the resource and they're going to bring that to the edge, is that the developers are going to be driving the applications at the edge. So if you're low latency edge, that's going to open up new applications, not just the obvious ones I just mentioned, gaming, VR, AR, metaverse, and or you know, other things that are obvious. There's going to be non-obvious things that are going to be huge that are going to come out from the developers. But the cloud native aspect of the hyperscalers to me is where the scales are tipping. Let me explain. IT was built to build a supply resource to the businesses who were writing applications, business applications, mostly driven by IBM in the mainframe in the old days, Dave. And then IT became IT. Telcos have been OT, closed. This is our thing. <laughs> That's it. Now they have to open up and the cloud native technologies is the fastest way to value. And I think that path, Sarpeet, is going to be defined by this, this new developer and this new super edge concept. So I, I think it's going to be wide open. I don't know what to say. I can't guess, but it's going to be Let creative. Me Let me ask you a question. Does, you, you said years ago, data is the new development kit. Does, does low code and no code, to Sarpeet's point, change the equation, in other words, putting data in the hands of those OT professionals, those practitioners who have the context, does low code and no code enable, you know, more of those quote unquote, I know it's a, a, a bromide, but the citizen developer. And and what impact does, does that have? And, and who's in the best position? Uh, well, to, the thing, uh, I think it, anything that reduces friction to getting stuff out there that can be automated will increase the value. And then, then the question is, that's not even a debate. That's just fact. That's going to be like massive rise. Then the issue comes down to who has the best asset the software asset that's eating the world, or the tower and the physical infrastructure. So if the physical infrastructure, AKA the telcos can't generate value fast enough, in my opinion, the private equity will come in and take it over and then refactor that business model to take advantage of the over the top software model. That, that, that to me is the big you know, stare down competition between the telco world and this new cloud native. Whichever one yields in value is going to blink first if you say, um, and I think the cloud native wins this one, hands down, because the assets are valuable, but only if they enable the, um, the, the new model. If the old model tries to hang on to the old hug, the old model, as uh, the edge hugger, as Sarvit says, they're just going to slowly milk that cow dry. So it's like, it's over. So to me, they have to move. And I think this Mobile World Congress day, we will see, we will be looking for that. Yeah, I, I think that in the Mobile World Congress context, I think telcos should partner with the hyperscalers very closely, like everybody else has. Uh, they have to sort of cave in. <laughs> I usually say that term, like the people cave in. Okay, IBM tried to you know fight and they cave in. Uh, uh, other you know second tier vendors try to fight the cl big cloud vendors, like top three or four, and then they cave in. You know, okay, we will serve our stuff through your cloud. And that's where all the buyers are sort of congregating to each other, going there to buy stuff. Uh, along with the, the skills gravity, the feature proximity, like another sort of term I'm trying to coin, matters a lot when you're doing one thing and you want to do another thing. When you're doing all these transactional stuff and regular stuff, and now you want to do data science, where do you go? You go uh, next to it, you know, wherever you have 
you have been you know yeah. your skills uh, are in that same sort of bucket and then also you don't have to write a new contract with a new vendor you just go there so uh, in order to serve this is a lesson for startups as well you need to prepare yourself for being in the cloud marketplaces you cannot go alone uh, independently, you know, like cloud marketplace is going to replace procurement for sure. We know that. I mean, yeah. and this brings up the point, Dave. We talked about years ago. Remember on the cube, we said there's going to be tier two clouds. I use that word in quotes because nothing. You know, what does it even mean, tier two? <laughs> and we were talking about like Amazon uh, versus Microsoft and Google. We said at the time, and Alibaba, because but they're in China. We'll put that aside for a second. But the big three, they're going to win it all, and they're all going to be successful to the relative terms. But whoever can enable that second tier, and it ended up happening. Snowflake is that example, as is Databricks, as is others. So who, Google and Microsoft, as fast as they can replicate the success of AWS by enabling someone to build their business on their cloud in a way that allows the customer to refactor their business, will win. They will win most of the lion's share, in my opinion. So I think that applies to the edge as well. So whoever can come in and say, whichever cloud says, I'm going to enable the next Snowflake, the next enterprise solution, I think takes it. Well, and I think that the, it comes back to, oh, every conversation comes back to the data. And if you think about the prevailing way in which we've treated data, with the exceptions of the two, you know, the data-driven companies in air quotes, is, is we've shoved all the data into a, some kind of single repository and tried to come up with a single version of the truth. And it's, and it's adjudicated by a, a centralized team with hyper-specialized roles. And then guess what? The line of business, there's no there's no context for the business in that you know data architecture, data corpus, if you will. And then the time it takes to go from idea for a data product or a data service to monetization is way too long. And that's changing. And the winners are going to be the ones who are able to exploit this notion of leaving data where it is. The point about data gravity, you're coining a new term. I like that. It was, I think you said skills gravity. But and then enabling the business lines to have access to their own data teams. That's exactly what Ali Gozi was saying this morning. And really having the ability to create their own data products without having to go bow down to an ivory tower. That is a, an emerging model. All right, well guys, I really appreciate the wrap up here, Dave. So I'd love to get your final thoughts. I'll just start by saying that one of the highlights for me was uh, the, the luminary guests, besides the 15 great companies, the luminary guests we had from our community on our keynotes uh, today. But Ali, Ali Goshi kind of said, don't listen to what the, everyone's saying in the press. That, that was his kind of, his position. He says, you got to figure out where the puck's going. And, and he didn't say that, but I'm saying, I'm paraphrasing what he said. And I love how he brought up Sky, Skynet, Dave. <laughs> SkyCloud, I call it Skynet. Um, that's an interesting philosophy. And then he also brought up that machine learning auto ML has got to be table stakes. So I think to me, that's the highlight walk away. And the second one is this idea that the enterprises have to have a new way to procure and not just the consumption, but vendor selection. I think it's going to be very interesting as value can be proved with data. So maybe the procurement process becomes, here's, some, here's a beachhead, here's a little bit of data. Let me see what you can do. I, I would say, again, I said this this morning that the the, the big four have given like last year they spent a hundred billion dollars more on capex. To me, that's a gift. But so many companies, especially the folks you know trying to hang on to the their legacy business, they're saying, well, not everything's going to move to the cloud. Whatever that should that's the, the narrative should change to, hey, thank you for that gift. We're now going to build value on top of the cloud. Ali Gozi, you know, laid that out how Databricks is doing it. It's clearly what Snowflake's doing with the data cloud. You, it basically a layer that abstracts all that underlying complexity and adds value on top, eventually going out to the edge. That's a value added model that's enabled by the hyperscalers. And, and that to me is, if I have to evaluate where I'm going to place my bets as a, as a CIO or IT practitioner, I'm going to look at who are the ones that are actually embracing that investment that's been made and adding value on top in a way that can drive my data driven, my digital business, whatever buzzword you want to throw on. Yeah, I, I think we are talking about the startups in, in today, today's uh, sessions. I, I think uh, for startups, my advice is to be like, uh, be as close as you can be to hyperscalers and anybody who avoids them, they will cave in at the end of the day because that's where the 
whole sort of spent gravity is that so the innovation gravity is that like everybody's gravitating towards that and there's and i would say that quite a few times in the last couple of years that the, the rate of innovation happening in the non-cloud companies when i would talk about non-cloud means are not public cloud companies i, I think it, it, it's sort of like diminishing if you will as compared to in cloud there's a lot of innovation the cloud companies are not ping by power people anymore they they have all sophisticated platforms and leverage that those and also leverage the marketplaces leverage their buyers and the, the key will be how you highlight yourself in that cloud marketplace, if you will. It's like in a grocery store where your product is, is is placed and you have to sort of market around it. You have to have a good storytelling team in place as well after you do the product market fit. I think that's that's a key. I think, um, yeah, just being close to, to the cloud providers, uh, uh, that's the, the way to go. Okay, real, real quick, each of you talk about what it takes to crack the code for the enterprise in the modern era now. Dave, we'll start with you. What's it take? Oh, you got to have, you, you got, I mean, it's age old, you got to have be solving a problem that is, that is, that is, you know, 10 X better and one tenth the cost of anybody else. If you're a small company, you, you know, that, that, that rule, number one, number two is you obviously got to get product market fit. You got to then figure out, and I think, and again, in your early phases, you have to be almost process builders, figure out, you know, your KPI should all be built around retention. What, how do I define customer success? How do I keep customers and how do I make them loyal? So that I know that my cost of acquisition is going to be, you know, at least one third or lower than my lifetime value of that customer. So you got to nail that. And then once you nail that, you got to codify that process in the next phase, which really subject gets into your platform discussion. And that's really where you can start to standardize and scale and figure out your go to market and the relationship between marketing spend and, and sales productivity. And then, and then when you get that right, then you got to move on to, to figure out your moat. Your moat might just be a brand. It might be, you know, some some secret sauce. But more often than not, though, it's going to be the relationship that you build. And I think you got to think about those phases. And in today's world, you got to move really fast. Sorry, real quick, what's the secret to crack the code? I, I think the secret to crack the code is partnership and alliances. Um, as a as a small company selling to the bigger enterprises, the vendor size will be a a a, and a one of the big objections. Even if they don't say it, it's on the back of their mind. On a, what if these guys disappear tomorrow? What will we do if we pick this technology? Another thing is like if you are building on the left side, which is the developer side, not on the right side, which is the operations or or production side, if you will. Um, you have to understand the sales cycles are longer on the right side and left side is easier to get to, but that's why we see a lot more um, startups in, on the left side, if you dev, DevOps kind of space, if you will, because it's easier to sell to practitioners and, and market to them and then show the value quickly. And, the, and, the, and also understand that on the left side, the developers are very know-how hungry on the, on the right side, people are very cost conscious. So understanding these the traits of these different uh, personas, if you will, buyers, uh, it will, I think, set you apart. And, and uh, as Dave said, like you have to solve a problem. Focus on practitioners first, because you're small. You have to solve particular problems very well, and then you can expand. Well guys, I really appreciate the time. Dave, we're going to do more of these. Sorry, we're going to do more of these. We're going to add more community to it. We're going to add our community rooms next time. We're going to do these quarterly and try to do them as more frequently. We learned a lot and we still got a lot more to learn. There's a lot more contribution out in the community that we're going to tap into. Certainly the Cube Club, as we call it, Dave. We're going to build this actively around cloud. This is another 20 years. The edge brings us more life with cloud. It's really exciting. And again, enterprise is no longer the enterprise. It's just the world now. So great companies here. The next Databricks, the next IPO, the next Big thing is in this list, Dave. Hey, John, we'll see you in Barcelona. Looking forward to that. Sarbjeet, I, I know in the second half, we're going to run into each other. So it's like to yep. see you take some selfies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, travel has started. Uh, great talking to you guys today and uh, have fun in Barcelona and uh, keep yeah. us. Thanks for coming on. I want to thank Natalie Ehrlich, who's in Rome right now. She's probably way past her bedtime, but she kicked it off in emceeing and hosting with Dave and I for this AWS Startup Showcase. This is batch two, episode two, Dave. What do we call this? It's like a release. It's a, the next 15 startups are coming. So we'll, yeah, we'll figure it out. 
<laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks.